Welcome to uh, today's lecture of Scalable Data Science. Uh, today we are going to start a slightly new topic and, uh, and we will start asking the question of uh, uh, how to answer near neighbor queries. Okay? Uh, I am Anirban and I am a faculty of computer science and engineering at IIT Gandhinagar. Okay? So, so here is the broad setting that suppose you have a set of data points and a query Q. Okay? And uh, these data points will be given to you beforehand. And you have to answer the question of what is the nearest data point to the query. The query is not known to you. right? You can pre-process the data points beforehand. And you have to answer the question of what is the nearest data point to the query. Well, this question itself is not very well posed yet because uh, what are we asking for? Are we, uh, are we asking for the k nearest neighbors or are we, are we, uh, are we given k or are we given some, some, some radius r and we are asking for the set of uh, the, all the set of points that are within distance r to the query q. And what is the distance function? Right? All of these need to be defined. But before we go ahead and define these, let us see what are some examples of this, uh, what are some use cases of this, of this particular problem. Right? It turns out that there are numerous applications. Right? Uh, uh, there is obviously a whole lot of applications in search. Right? Suppose you are, you are sort of uh, designing a search engine in which, in which you give an image and you are asking for similar images. Okay? There is also are a, a large application in, in deduplicating web search. Right? And one of the major applications that, uh, that hap, uh, I mean in these search engines is that in the web what you would see is that there are multiple copies of a web page. Right? Because maybe it is a news article, right? maybe it is a news article from Associated Press and the same news article are basically very, very similar news articles have appeared in, uh, in the, the I mean slight modified versions of it or even the same article with some, with some ads on top of it has appeared in multiple pages. Right? And as a sort of nice search engine, you would not want your front page, you would not want your search page to be loaded with multiple copies of the same article because it, the user does not get much out of seeing multiple copies of the same article. So, what all the search engines do and it also takes up a lot more space, it also takes up a lot more sort of resources in terms of crawling, bandwidth resource in terms of crawling, storage space in terms of storing multiple copies of the same article and a whole lot of confusion. Right? Plus, it might also confuse you the ranking uh, because now I mean all these articles, all the different copies if you regard them as different articles, they are pointing to the all their outlinks are, are pointing to the same set of web pages. So, the page rank gets modified and so on. Right? So, you want to do near, uh, deduplication right? and for various reasons this is not exact deduplication right? because two web pages they might have the slightly different HTML, they might have slightly different ads or, or CSS or, and, 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 and so it is not exact duplicates in terms of the, uh, 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 in terms of the entire web page content. Right? So, this near duplication for, um, for, for web pages is a very big application of, of, the, of locality sensitive hashing and we will go over it, we uh, will see something related to that. It is also a very natural question to ask in clustering, right? because uh, what is clustering, uh, I mean after all rather than just clubbing the same items together. Right? And, then, and then we could kind of ask that okay, given a particular, given a particular uh, no, given a particular data point, what are the, uh, what are the items that are close to it, right? that is what uh, we are asking. There is an obvious application in designing a nearest neighbor classifier. So, a nearest neighbor classifier is basically one in which given a test point, right, you would look at the neighbors around it, these neighbors, you would look at the, the labels of the neighbors around it and you would assign a label to the test point based on the labels of the neighbors. So, before you assign it a label, you need to answer the question of how do I find the nearest neighbors efficiently. Right? A slight variant of this problem which requires slightly different set of algorithms is a question of all pair near neighbors in which rather than being given a particular query, you are given the data set and you have to find out all pairs of all, I mean all pairs of, of data points that are considered near neighbors. So again, what is a nice solution to this algorithm? 
right, before we start looking at smarter solutions. So, the naive solution, the most naive solution is of course the naive scan, right, that given the, that given a query at query time, you do, uh, you, you, you sort of go over all the data points, right, and uh, if you assume that the data points are in, are in RD, right, we haven't explicitly mentioned that, but, but this is the, but this is the diamond, but this is the, uh, the, the size of, if you assume them to be vectors in, in RD, then you need time order n which is the number of points times order d to compare each point with the query right so that needs total time order nd to answer the nearest neighbor question this is exact of course this might be too much right i mean n could potentially be if you are a sort of self respecting data scientist you you're dealing with n to be millions right and d d is also potentially large and at a at test time uh, you certainly don't have enough time uh, to to sort of uh, do this exhaustive search. So, what can we do? The other extreme alternate, uh, uh, I mean alternative is, com is to compute the Voronoi partition of the, of the point set. So, what is the Voronoi partition? So, the given a particular set of points, a Voronoi partition is the following, is the following, is, is the following partitioning of the, of the space. So, imagine that we are in R2, right? And now, we have marked off the region that of all, of all points that are closest to this particular blue point. That is the Voronoi cell for the blue point, right? And similarly, uh, we do this for every for every other point. Where, uh, I mean, I can do this for this for this. Let's call this a pink point, right? Then I then I mark out this cell, right? And so on, right? So of course, the Voronoi partition depends on the on the other points that are there in the data, right? But once if you were able to do this, once a query point comes, you just need to check which Voronoi partition it falls in and that would give you the exact answer. However, life is not as smooth, right? So, the Voronoi partition in two, in two dimensions is fine, but the Voronoi partition in, in, in D dimension needs a lot of storage. In fact, it can need storage of the order of n to the power D by 2, right? Uh, which is uh, not nice. Right? I mean, because the, I mean, while uh, we don't want to spend time order n d, we we can not also not spend uh, time n time or space that's n to the power d. That's even worse, right? Because once you store the Voronoi partition, you I mean, given a query point, you also have to calculate it. I mean, uh, I mean, that is really the number of faces of the Voronoi partition. So, given a query point, you have to compare it with each of these faces and so on. That's that's like too much. So, I don't want to do this. Okay. So, one set of techniques that we look at in this lecture are called space partitioning trees. So, what is a space partitioning tree? The intuitive idea is very simple actually. It says that let us recursively partition given the points, right? Suppose given the points, let us recursively partition the space, right? So, let us say that we, uh, we first partition it according to, uh, I mean according to the x and the y axis, right? And then we, and then we, and then we, and then we again partition it according to here. Then we again partition it according to here. Then we again partition it here. Then we again partitioning it, it here, right? So, uh, uh, so why am I calling it a tree? I'm calling it a tree because you can imagine that the on the top level partition had four children, right? Corresponding to the four axis. Then, then each of these partitions again has four children corresponding to the four axis that it creates and so on, right? So, this, right? And then, and then given a query, given a query point, you just, um, for every node, you just ask, okay, which of these ch children do I need to go down into, right? So, this is a broad framework, right? The partitioning method that I showed you is really the most naive one, right? This broad framework can be made concrete in a bunch of different ways and we will see a couple of different ways, right? And there is also a bunch of ways to search for a given query, right? The most critical thing, the most critical step in this, in this framework is, is to decide how to do the partition and we will see a few ways of, of how to do this partition. So, one of the very, very common ways that is very sort of much used even today is known as KD trees. 
right so this was initially proposed by uh, by by uh, by bentley in uh, in around 1970 and uh, uh, when it was initially developed i mean the number k used to denote the number of dimensions so it used to be called 2d trees 3d trees and so on but now it has just gone into the name okay so what is the intuition here the intuition here is that each level of the tree uses a single dimension to partition okay how does it choose the dimension what is the value in the dimension all that will come right so so let's let's see an ex, uh, so let's see the algorithm right so we start with the entire set of points with each level you you associate a cutting dimension let's say you have like three dimensions so so what we were trying to do is is cycle through these dimensions essentially let's say we start with the first dimension and and say we we form the first cut according to some threshold in the first dimension then the second level uh, at the second level we use the second dimension right and then we uh, and then we choose some threshold in the second some hyperplane or some plane in the second dimension to cut the second to make the second level children and so on right now how do i choose the threshold what we would do is as follows at every step right we would try to balance out the tree Right? We will try to keep the number of left children equal to the more or less equal to the number of right children. And the way to do that would be to say that, okay, you have considered a dimension, right? You have a set of points that you want to partition al uh, along this dimension. Now look at the value, the coordinate values of the points along this dimension. So, so, so you have this dimension that you have chosen. You have the points that you want to partition, right? And look at the coordinate values of these points along this dimension take the median coordinate value and use that as the threshold in this dimension so basically then you put points to the left all the points to the left of the median in one of in one child all the points to the right of the median in one child so this would be a kd tree with two children per per node okay and uh, and uh, this this would this would and and we would create an axis aligned partition that uses the median value in every in, in each of the dimensions okay so let's do a small example maybe hmm. let's do a small example let's suppose we have let's do a small example in uh, in in r2 itself right so maybe first we choose the dimension uh, we choose to partition along this dimension. This is, so this is my first cut. Next, maybe. So my first tree is this, and then we go left and right. S one, S two. Then we partition. We have this set of points S one, right? Now, now we need to partition S one. Right? Then we choose the median here. Let's say that the median here is this. Right? So this would be the cell S11. This would be the cell S12. Right? Now here the median partition might be this. So right maybe s11 and s12 you don't want to partition anymore because they have only one point but maybe here you want to partition suppose we had some few more points here maybe here here you want to partition according to this here maybe you want to partition according to this so this is s221 s222 s211 s Two, one, two. So I'm just numbering this arbitrarily according to some note, some notation that I have. The numbers don't really mean much. The num, uh, the labels of the partitions. Okay. So at these points, so now we have the partitions, and 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 in the leaves you store the data points, right? And you could there is also a data point associated with every with every with every node, right? Because because we're using the medians. So you could say that the uh, uh, the inner node S one 
stores the data point, uh, uh, stores the data point this one, this, right. The inner node S2 stores this data point, right, and so on, right. The first root node stores the data point this, stores this root data point, okay. So, now given a particular query, what would, uh, uh, what would we do? That is the question, right. So, suppose, suppose we are given a query here, what would we do, right. Or maybe if you, uh, or maybe the query lies here, what should we do, right. And there are different things that you can do here, right. And, and, and let us go over these, some of these, okay. So, the space taken is clearly order n for the data structure, right, because, because you sort of, uh, you do not replicate anything, you just divide the entire set of points, you keep on dividing and that is it. So, there are typically three strategies for, uh, for nearest neighbor search in KD trees, okay. Uh, so, the first strategy is known as a defeatist search, okay. What you do there is that you only search the child that contains the query point, right. What does that mean? What, uh, what that means is that suppose you have divided the, uh, uh, suppose you have divided according to here, right. And then, and then, and then uh, suppose your query point falls, uh, your query point is here, falls here, right. So, then from the root you would only go to the left, and from this child, you would again go to the right. So, so root, you go to the left, and then you go to the right. Right? You search, you search only in this. But as you can imagine, that this might not be entirely correct, because it's possible, for instance, that the nearest neighbor to this, to this particular point, lies somewhere here. Right? Maybe there is nothing. I mean, maybe there is one point in the cell, but maybe that point is very far off here. So, just because the query point falls in this cell does not mean that the nearest neighbor will be in this cell, right, because the, because the nearest, because the cells, because the query point might be close to some boundary of the cell. Therefore, the nearest neighbor, I mean ideal place for the nearest neighbor would be somewhere else, okay. But the, but what the defeatist search does is that it just, it just, uh, I mean it does not consider that, it just keeps on going and then, and then if it, if it does not find anybody, if it finds anybody in the cell, it returns that which might be wrong or it just gives up if it does not find anybody in the cell. So, that is it, okay. So, then the descending search, right. What it would do is that uh, uh, it would say that, okay, let me see, let me go down this cell, right, and let me maintain the current nearest neighbor and the distance to it. So, for instance, it would say that, okay, I have gone down this cell and then my candidate nearest neighbor is this. Okay. So, it maintains the distance to it. And then it looks at the path that it has followed, right. For instance, it went, it went left here, it went right here. And then it says that, okay, uh, if this is the radius, if I consider a ball of this radius, right, does it intersect, which other cells does it intersect, right. Then it sees that it intersects this other cell and therefore, I must go up my recursion tree and explore this other cell also. Okay, so it does that. So basically, and then and, and then it gets this this uh, potential nearest neighbor as the candidate, and then it says that okay, let me consider now this new ball. So which other cells does it intersect? So this is a bad drawing, but but you get the idea, right? So so it it, it keeps on exploring the uh, it sort of sees it has a candidate near uh, uh, nearest neighbor near neighbor, it and the candidate distance to it, it sees how many it constructs a ball around the query point and sees which of the cells does this intersect and then it goes and explores those cells also by, by winding up the recursion, okay. And, and therefore, once it explores it, the candidate uh, near neighbor gets a little closer because you might change the candidate and so the candidate distance also gets a little closer, okay. So, so, so this is, this is definitely going to give you the nearest neighbor, right, but it might end up searching the entire entire tree. A slightly better, a slightly better combination uh, of, of these two is, is what is known as a priority search. In which case, it does, what it does is that as it is going down the tree, maybe as it is, uh, as it is going down the tree, the query point maintains a priority over the, uh, over the 
uh, over the regions depending on the distance. For instance, it says that okay, this I have uh, I have gone down this tree to here, 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 here. But but now uh, if I look at all the all the particular partitions that are all the cells that I've seen, my distance to this cell is this much. My distance to this particular cell is this much. My distance to this cell is this much, and my distance to this cell is is this much, right? Not this. It is. It is. It is this. It is this, right? And so and so and so it gives a priority Q over all these over all these cells, right? And, and, and then it decides to visit the cells based on the priority queue. Okay. So, depending on how you implement the priority queue and where you terminate the search, uh, this can also return you, I mean guarantee you that the, that the nearest neighbor will be returned. However, again in the worst case you can potentially end up searching all the nodes. And that is the basic problem with the KD trees, right? that it does not do a very good job of uh, answering the nearest neighbor queries in the uh, in the case of uh, in the in the worst case, right? So there are several variants of space partition entries possible, as I mentioned, right? And here are a few of the more important ones. There is something called a random projection tree, right? What does it do? Remember that we are par uh, creating a partition at every step, right? What it does is that when it starts with the data. Right. Let's say let's say that this is the let's say that this is the data. Right. This is the data. It it sort of takes a random hyperplane and tries to partition the data and, and partitions the data as lying either on the left of it or on the right of it. And then it, it again once it does the partition and this will approximately divide the data into half. And again, once it does it, this uh, I mean, uh, this takes another random hyperplane. This takes another random hyperplane and tries to partition the data. And then this takes another random hyperplane. The, uh, this takes another random hyperplane here, another one here, another one here, and tries to partition the data. Right? And that's how it keeps on growing the left and the right, uh, the right subtree of any of any node. Okay, this is known as RP tree or random projection tree. I mean, again, a variant of this is is that you could use any other direction, right? And then uh, uh, you could use something like the principal eigenvector of the covariance matrix, right? What is intuition here? The intuition is the uh, it is that the direction of the principal eigenvector of the covariant matrix is the one along which you can partition the data the most. It's the one uh, the direction of the maximum variance. So therefore, if you have a hyperplane that is orthogonal to the, that direction, that cuts the data, that separates the data the the most in some in some surface to volume kind of uh, ratio, right? That, that I mean, we can make this a little more precise, but but in a surface to volume sense, you are uh, you you can uh, if you take the direction that is orthogonal to the take the hyperplane that is orthogonal to the to, to the principal uh, eigenvector, you get a you get a good direction to separate the data, right? And and you can keep on doing that. So you at every node. So first you take the entire data set, cal calculate the principal eigenvector and partition according to that. Then you have the left subtree, you have the right subtree. Again, you calculate the, uh, the covariance matrix of, of these two. You again take the principal eigenvectors and then and then and then separate and keep on doing this. So this is a little expensive, right? It's it, it performs not. I mean, the performance is not bad. Uh, it's a little. It's not trivial to uh, analyze, and it's also a little expensive because at every time point you're calculating the principal eigenvector. Then there's the two mean tree, right? Which says that okay, let's. Calculate the principle. Let's not exactly calculate the principal eigenvector. Let's try to do a two clustering of the data, right? Which is effectively what the principal eigenvector is trying to do. Let's try to put some to the left. I mean, uh, uh, let's try to run k-means with k equal to two, for instance. And uh, we take the centers. We take the two centers and we take the line separating the two centers. So if the two center is the cluster, so look like this. We take the two centers. We take the orthogonal direction of the, the orthogonal hyperplane to the to, to the line connecting the two centers, and we use that to separate the data. Right. So if the data has nice cluster structure, this will, this will of course work nicely. So the problem is that it's very hard to quantify the worst case performance of any one of them, of of any of these. However, there are possible ways to try to analyze these, right? And these, and these, uh, and these particular techniques, they they all can be analyzed in terms of this common theme, right? Uh, you could try to ask that if I use a space partitioning tree, does the partitioning algorithm 
adapt to the intrinsic dimensionality of the data. So, what do I mean by intrinsic dimensionality? For instance, so imagine that you have uh, you have uh, you, uh, you have a piece of paper in uh, that you are holding up in three dimensions. So, although and and you take points on this piece of paper, right? So, although the dimensionality, these points have a three-dimensional, these are points in three dimensions, they really lie on this on this two-dimensional plane. Right? Similarly, what might happen is that although the data is being represented in a high dimension, the effective dimension somehow it more or less lies in a low dimensional plane, subspace. Okay? So, what we would really like is that if the data lies in some low dimension really, in that I mean the, the partitioning algorithm should really depend on this intrinsic dimensionality of the data. Right? It is not I mean and, and, and here is one way to, to kind of formalize this. Right? What we might want to say is that okay, if the intrinsic dimension is D, so note that I have not really defined to you what intrinsic di dimensionality is. But if the intrinsic dimensionality is D, then after order D levels and why order D because we are cycling through all the dimensions. That after we have cycled through all the dimensions, we substantially shrink the size of each cell, right? The, the size of each cell becomes something like half of, of what it was uh, at this step. Okay? So, if that happens, then I can say that the depth of the tree is something like d log the maximum diameter of the of the data set, right? D times the log of the diameter of the original data set, right? Which means that the it's it's of it's of it's reasonably small. Okay? So, in order to formalize this, you need to know what is the uh, max, I mean how to sort of formalize the intrinsic dimension. There are a couple of ways to do this. There is something called Aswa, Aswa dimension. Uh, so, here is one, one sort of easy to state way to do this. Right? We say that the intrinsic dimensionality, sometimes we say that the intrinsic dimensionality of a data set is D. Right? If we look at the D largest eigenvalues of the covariance matrix and they account for 1 minus epsilon fraction of the trace. So, remember that the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. Right? So, if the if taking if the uh, if the original dimension is capital D, but only small d of the so think of small d as let us say let us say 10 percent of capital D. If only small d of the largest eigenvalues account for a more or less the entire trace let us say 99 percent of the trace then we will say that the intrinsic dimensionality is small d. Okay? And it is known so why is this definition important? Because it is known that at least for some of the at least for some of the algorithms, right? For instance, the RP, the random projection, and the principal uh, direction trees adapt to this definition of the dimension. That is, they have this particular property. They have uh, they have uh, this particular property when you define the intrinsic dimension in terms of the covariance matrix. Okay, but something like the KD trees does not adapt to the intrinsic dimension because it is always using the median it is not really using uh, the, the structure any any deeper structure of the of the data. Right? So, so, in general uh, the rule of thumb is that if you are really interested in, in working with space partition trees it might be useful to look at RP trees and principal direction trees uh, unless of course, you have, uh, you, have a, you, do, you have a library implementation of KT trees and you do not want to implement anything on your own. But uh, but these are but the but the RP trees and the and the uh, uh, the RP trees and the pre D trees are almost always better performing than the ordinary KD tree. So just to summary, uh, just to summarize, we introduced the nearest neighbor question in this lecture. We also looked at uh, a family of algorithms based on space partitioning trees, uh, and the, and the rule of thumb is that uh, if you are trying to choose one out of this family, you should try to choose one that adapts to the intrinsic dimensionality of the data. Right? And two of the ones that we saw uh, and two of the ones that I mentioned are random projection trees and principal direction and principal direction trees. So, if you want to uh, look into more into some of these, there is this uh, uh, book uh, uh, by Professor Samet on foundations of multidimensional and metric data structures. There is also a bunch of very nice papers uh, by uh, Professor Sanjay Das Gupta and, and in particular this particular paper talks about the notion of intri uh, uh, intrinsic dimension. Uh, and how it applies to the different space partitioning trees. Uh, so, feel free to look at that and that is it for this lecture. Thank you.